Welcome to an RMSO roundtable drive. These roundtable drives are our form of a podcast. You can just sit and listen to us talk. There will be breaks in the talking while we enjoy the scenery and look for Bigfoot shapes. We're climbing to the top of the Grand Mesa. There's a lot of Bigfoot sightings that centralize around this mesa, including the top of the mesa. There's also the famous Bigfoot video at the top of the mesa where I guess a couple hit the Bigfoot and thought that they hit a person or an animal. This happened at night. And they backed up to make sure the animal, person, whatever was okay. And a Bigfoot got up and chased after the car. Now, the passenger, a girl, she had her cell phone turned on recording after they hit whatever, you know, so she could document what was going on. And so she captured this thing in the um, backup camera viewer getting up and coming after him. The driver, of course, is actually looking at the creature through the, you know, the rear view window. Yeah, as he's backing up and then the video cuts out because he puts the car in drive to get away from the upset Bigfoot chasing the car. And then the rear video camera stops recording. So that's all that it has. But there is some of it recorded. There's enough there that Thinker Thunker was able to do a breakdown and give us a size of the creature because it's it's on the top on a road similar to this. It's got the painted lanes, a two-lane road. So you got the width of the road to be able to compare. And, you know, this creature's eight feet tall or taller. So, you know, I saw comments on the original video where people are like, it's a homeless person, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's, it's a homeless person. It's a gigantic hairy one. <laughs> and a really and, tough one too. <laughs> and it moves like a Bigfoot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so that's a, a famous one on video. Famous to me anyway. And then there's the sightings and vocalizations up at the top. Jenny and I have done um, several investigations around uh, Kona Creek and Carson Lake because of the the sightings and vocalizations in those areas. But I know for a fact that Bigfoot does not stay at the spot that it was spotted last. (laughs) So we like to go up and check out different lakes every time we come up, you know, their water sources. There's over 300 lakes up here. We just talked a little while at the last store that we were at. A girl that was helping us, she lives up near Powderhorn. And I was like, every time I go up there, I just have a hard time in imagining that there's 300 lakes. And she's like, 365 lakes or something like that. And I'm like, oh, so 300 real conservative. Yeah, she said that you can go to a new lake every single day of the year if you want. Crazy. Yeah, Jenny and I have probably only seen like 5% of the lakes up here. So, there's reliable water sources up there. Everywhere. Creature wanted to stay up there year-round. It could. I have a feeling because the the top of the mesa is 11,000 feet. I have a feeling in the winter time it drops down off of the mesa. And as a matter of fact, a couple of December's ago, 
a person contacted us and, uh, from Orchard Mesa, which is down by Grand Junction, and said that they had a Bigfoot in their backyard, and that was in a December. So, I just don't think the creature in the middle of December wants to be up where the snow's 10 feet deep. So it comes down by the rivers and everything. I do believe that Kona Creek is one of its highways off and on the Mesa. If there's sightings down at in the valley by Kona Creek and then Kona Creek starts up by Carson Lake where there's the sightings and really good vocalizations that come out of there. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's creepy. I mean, it's really super pretty, and I really like it there, but sometimes it is just creepy, and it gives you the, the creeps just to be there. Oh, something else that happened up, um, this was actually over by the Land's Edge, which Carson Lake and Kona Creek isn't very far from Land's Edge, but a couple of years ago, this was in national news, a dude got tackled off of his four-wheeler and roughed up. He wouldn't say what did it, but he said it wasn't a bear. It was big, black, wasn't a bear. The authorities that helped him out looked at his... I guess injuries. his injuries and all that, you know, they all, they all racked it up as a black bear, tackled him off of his four-wheeler and roughed him up and everything, but he adamantly says it wasn't a bear. Okay, was it the same thing that those people hit and then chased their car? Did he get tackled off of his four-wheeler by a, a Bigfoot? <laughs> Yeah, he's not saying it's a Bigfoot, he's just saying it wasn't a bear. It wasn't a bear. Well, what, it wasn't. It just wasn't a bear. Yeah, I don't know too many animals that will tackle you off your four-wheeler. <laughs> I don't either. I mean, I know I know a, a black bear can and will. Sure. But he says that's not what it was. So that's potentially another sighting that's documented through injuries and can't have a little mysterious. Those wildlife officials never did come up with definitive proof of uh, bear tracks or anything like that, but, you know, what do you do? They're not going to say. Yeah, they're going to say what it was most likely that did it. And there is a large population of black bears up there, or down here too. Yeah, I wouldn't say anything to jeopardize my job as well. Yeah, I mean, nobody's going to sit there and say, it's this unproven creature. <laughs> or a bear, yeah, you're going to default to... It's probably a bear. A bear knocked him off his wheeler. <laughs> bear's pissed off because he got hit by a couple a couple of years ago, and he's got a vendetta. <laughs> Yeah, these are the areas we hike in. <laughs> <laughs> now that video of the backup camera that the Bigfoot got up and chased that vehicle, you can plainly see it's not a bear. So yeah, we come up and investigated the, the sighting that happened in that December. Yeah, by the time they gave us the sighting report, um, like a week after it happened we probably arrived about three weeks after it actually happened and we ended up in Escalante what is it Dominguez Dominguez Escalante National uh -huh, Forest we actually stayed over in Montrose where there was a, a sighting on the outskirts of town where a couple of boys had the Bigfoot looking in their bedroom window and they actually shot at the creature to scare it off. So we stayed over in that area and that's by uh, the Gunnison Canyon, Black Canyon, 
So we scoped out that area and then um, this orchard mesa was closer to the Dominguez National Forest or whatever it was. So we went back in there poking around. But that Dominguez Escalante National Forest seems like a great place for the Bigfoot to go during the winter time. Because I think we ended up there in like a January and there was hardly any snow on the ground there. Yeah, it wasn't too cold. Mm -mm. And there was tons of deer. I mean, let's face it, the deer come down off the mesa too. They prefer not to be in 10 feet of snow either. And when I say there gets to be 10 feet of snow on top of the mesa, I am not exaggerating. We've come up in the middle of the winter many times and we've seen the snow 15 feet deep up there before. That's ridiculous. It's 11,000 feet tall when the storm clouds hit this giant mesa. It, it forces them to drop their moisture. But we like to come and check this area out year around, hoping to get lucky. Yeah, we knew that there was a 70% chance of rain and snow the whole time that we were going to be here. I mean, we planned this a couple of, several weeks ago. The forecast looked good when we made the plans, but they just got worse and worse. But you never know. People see Bigfoot in bad, bad weather, good weather. We're hoping that there's enough break in the weather while we're out here that we can do some of the hikes that we got planned to some of the remote lakes up here. It's amazing when you get on top of this mesa and you get to vantage points like Land's Edge and other places like that where you can see down into the valley and beyond. You can see all the way into Moab and Utah from up here. You can see the mountains of Silverton that surround Silverton. I mean, on a clear day, you can just see like hundreds of miles, it seems like. Yeah, I'm familiar with a lot of the formations in, in and around Moab. So you get up there and you're like, hey, that's Moab over there. Yeah, I'm estimating that Moab is 80, 90 miles from the top of Land's Edge. I mean, I may be off by a dozen miles or so, but around 90 miles. Yeah, studying Bigfoot sighting reports, a lot of these Bigfoot sightings down in the valleys, high desert areas around Grand Junction, Montrose, Orchard Mesa, I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. But then you, when you discover the Grand Mesa and you check out the Grand Mesa, you're like, this is massive, nice, squatchy habitat, and then the creature probably migrates seasonally back and forth between this and uh, Dominguez Escalante National Forest in the wintertime, this mesa in the summertime, a bunch of deer crossing in front of us. That's, those are elk. Nope, they're deer. Sorry. I <laughs> didn't have my glasses on. So in order to get to these places, it's got to cross through these towns.
and I'm sure the Squatch being nocturnal does it at night and it probably sticks to the rivers that get it back and forth rivers and creeks yeah you look at maps instead of your reports and you really don't get it until you go and you check out the area yourself and then you're like ah you have a aha moment what's actually going on why the creatures there why it's seen different parts different times of the year I mean a lot of the sightings down in the valley or or winter time early spring late fall and then on the Mesa most of those are summertime fall or spring sightings. I've yet to hear of a middle of the winter sighting when the snow's 10 feet deep up here. There's the top of the mesa that we're headed towards in front of us. I do, be I do believe from the valley below to the top of the mesa we go up about six to seven thousand feet to get up to the eleven thousand feet at the top so Jenny's studying her maps right now I'm glad she's a map person because she's a real good navigator getting us in and out of hard to find places it's my job especially when we're dirt roading it this is one of our favorite places in Colorado to Bigfoot. It's pretty. I love the entire state of Colorado. This is just the shortest drive from where we live. Yeah. For uh, for a Bigfoot sighting hotspot in Colorado. This takes us about five hours to get here. And we're wondering if we're going to see snow when we get to the top. It's just beautiful. Find anything interesting? Going over the map? No, oh, I was just. Um... orienting myself. Yeah, a couple of days ago when I had you on the phone, I had a. Google Maps trying to orient myself for our plans that we have up here. We always have a plan A, B, sometimes a C, and then we get somewhere and we end up having to do plan Z. <laughs> and because of the 70% rain, our plan A, B, and C may not happen. But there's that 30% chance it's going to stop for a little while. Then we'll go hike in the mud. We could be limited to base camp squatching for most of this, and that's fine. There's a lot of people that base camp squatch with their parabolic mics and stuff like that. We use shotgun microphones. We also have a parabolic mic. Brody has that. He's got an 8 inch parabolic and it's very powerful. But our uh, shotgun microphones are just as powerful as a 4 inch parabolic. Isn't there another weird story about 
Bigfoot at the base of the mesa, the girl that was babysitting, and one tried to come in the house or something. That's like, where we're from. That's over uh, by Pineview. Alright, then that was another one. There, I don't know, there's so many Bigfoot sightings in this area, you may be recalling one similar. Last time we were up here, we got caught in a snowstorm and they shut the road down that we were on. That was scary. And we got stuck. Yeah, they closed the road before our base camp. And, you know, that's where all of our stuff was at. So we went around the road closed sign, you know, because our stuff's back there. And then we ended up getting stuck at base camp and we had to get a farmer to come pull us out with his tractor. We had to spend that night with no heat. It is cold. Yeah, we... We have done a little bit of suffering here and there for the <laughs> sake of finding Bigfoot. <laughs> There's been a lot of times that we've... Uh, camped in the snow with no heat. I remember one of the coldest times uh, we tent camped uh, at Palisades. In Idaho. Uh-huh, and Jenny and I each had two sleeping bags, and the first night we each got in a sleeping bag, and then we unzipped our other sleeping bags like a blanket and laid over the tops ourselves. And partway into the night, Jenny zipped her second sleeping bag up and tacoed them both together. <laughs> and she said that she stayed warm and I just froze all night. So the next night, I did the same thing. And if you're ever in that situation, that's the best way to go. If you can taco your, kind of like a chalupa. Make a burrito. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that was Not a lot of people cold. carry two sleeping bags around with them everywhere, though, but... We knew it was going to be cold, so we brought four sleeping bags, two apiece. And our sleeping bags are sub-zero sleeping bags. And I'll tell you what, they... Once it gets under freezing... You just even the best sleeping bags just did not seem good enough. No. What I don't like about sleeping in the super super cold is it hurts to breathe the cold air. But then you put your head under the sleeping bag and then you feel like you're suffocating. Well, it's like a lose lose situation there. Yeah, I've come back from many a Bigfoot expedition in sub-freezing temperatures and come down with pneumonia or bronchitis. Those sub-freezing temperatures will give it to me sometimes, so I, I try not to do it as often. I've learned 
it's cold enough to freeze water, I probably should not be camping out in it. No. But it, it still happens. We don't make a habit of it like we used to back in the day. Yeah, I decided to create this organization in 2007. And then it was 2011 that Jenny and I got really serious about doing this. And we were trying to force a sighting to happen. We were constantly out there, any condition, summer, winter, it didn't matter. We were always out there and now, I mean, we're out there a lot, but we're not trying to force it. We're just out there trying to have a good time, relaxing, putting ourselves in the spot where Bigfoot is spotted the most and hope it happens. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not tent camping out in the two feet of snow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it seemed like for five years in a row there, I had either bronchitis or pneumonia or both in the same winter. When we end up camping out in the snow, it's kind of by accident. Like, we were camping out in Montana on the Idaho border at the Deadly Bauman Bigfoot location. We were tent camping there, and it was August. And we did not expect it. We woke up to like four inches of snow one morning. I mean, Montana, it can snow any month of the year. Yeah, I woke up in the morning. I, I was like, gosh, it's awful cold. Wow, I can see my breath. I go outside of the tent and I'm like, oh my heck. It like seriously snowed. <laughs> That was our very first time camping at the Deadly Bauman location. It took us several years to figure out where it was exactly, of researching the story, going out there, looking around, and that was the first year that we felt like we definitively found it. And that was a terrifying expedition. didn't get much sleep. Yeah, the night before we left on the expedition, Jenny and I watched a Russian video of a big old suburban type vehicle that ran over a, a, a Russian brown bear. And it knocked the Russian brown bear out and was trapped under the wheel of the car. Then it come to and it lifted that Suburban off of itself and it was mad and it ripped the tire off of that Suburban and the people in the car that were filming it doing all that then it turned on them and you could just tell that it could have gotten those people's car and got to them in like two seconds flat <laughs> they were I mean, screaming that, and crying that car was like a soda pop can to that, that bear and they tore off out of there. Well, where we were at, Jenny and I, is, is a grizzly bear location. As a matter of fact, the year before that we were there, we were talking to a business owner that ran a bed and breakfast out there. And we stopped in there and had some breakfast there. And we were asking him about the, the bear sightings in the area. He's like, oh, there are no grizzly bears here. He got all upset that we even brought that up. And then two weeks later, it's in the national news. A couple got mauled to death right there, just a few miles from where he was telling us that there wasn't grizzly bears. Yeah, uh, business owners and people who make money off of tourism and things of that nature don't want the word grizzly bear or wolf mentioned anywhere around their establishment because... 
It's a deterrent. Yeah. And we were, you know, there was people eating, eating and it. staying there. Yeah, so he, he brushed that under the rug real quick. But anyway, this year it's been in the news. They've been tracking uh, four grizzly bears in that same area. So it's a grizzly bear area. So, you know, we watch that video and then we go in there and we tent camp. And anyway, when we were setting up camp, we found this great spot next to the river. And the elk were across the river from us, vocalizing, making their bugles and all that. And it's just, it's just so awesome hearing that. So I set up a camera to film Jenny and I setting up camp, hoping to get those vocalizations of the elk. And not even a minute after I set up that camera, something on the mountain just roars. And I've heard a lot of bears vocalize and everything, and not saying it wasn't a bear, but I've just never heard a bear vocalization quite like that. Just a big old roar. And it scared the elk away. And this is just as the sun's going down, so now Jenny and I are kind of tripping like, what did that on the mountain? Well, anything that can roar like that is going to be scary. Anything. <laughs> Whatever it is. So anyway, that night we could hear something pacing back and forth across the river from us as we're trying to go to sleep. And it's just like the bombing incident. They could hear and they also saw the Bigfoot pacing back and forth the river from them several nights in a row before they shot it and everything happened. You guys will have to look up the bombing thing. I don't want to get into his story, but that's where we were camping at. And so we kept the fire stocked up. We kept going out and putting more wood on the fire, getting our spotlight and trying to see what was going on across the river. And there's giant willows and everything. And willows are like 9 to 12 feet tall. I mean, a moose just melts right into them. So a Bigfoot, a grizzly bear have no problem hiding in the willows. And then partway through the night, Jenny heard it coming across the river onto our side. So yeah, we didn't sleep at all. In an aggressive Bigfoot location, grizzly bear location, and then it snowed on us. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting cold? Yeah. Yeah, it's just barely above freezing up here. It's only 36 degrees. All right, well, we love doing these podcasts, driving round tables from the front seat of the car so you guys can see where we're spending a week. This is the, the Bigfoot location. It isn't just the couple of mile hike you guys are going to you guys are getting to see the greater area. We're almost to our camp. You guys get to hear some of our experiences, some of the Bigfoot sighting reports that bring us into the area to search for Bigfoot. One of my favorites is the Bigfoot chasing the, the car up here. Captured on video. In the um, description of this video, I'll put a link to the blog that I have of that video, so you guys can watch it yourselves. And that, that'll be on YouTube. If you guys are watching this on Facebook, you'll have to visit us on YouTube to get that link. And our YouTube is uh, RMSO Bigfoot on YouTube. Or you can also look us up by Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization. You can also go to our blog spot and do a search on the blog spot for um, for that also. And our blog spot is RMSO Bigfoot blog spot. going to glass 
the opposite side of this lake for a minute. I hope you guys enjoyed our round table drive. You guys got to see 30, 40 miles of the Grand Mesa. We are on the top. Keep on watching. We're going to keep on squatching.